And now we come to this part of our service where we ask the Holy Spirit to prepare us to receive from the Word, to hear hopefully what Jesus would teach if he were unpacking this scripture. So let's go to the Spirit in prayer. Holy Spirit, last week was Trinity Sunday, and we we got to uh, read together that creed that talks about um, you coming forth from the Father and the Spirit uh, that you are also worshipped and glorified. And, and Holy Spirit, we, we certainly don't want to give you uh, short, strif, short shrift and not pay attention to you. But frankly, uh, let's be honest, you are a little harder to picture. We understand Jesus, he became flesh and walked among us so we can picture a Middle Eastern guy. There's lots and lots of artist depictions of what Jesus might have looked like. There's lots and lots of descriptions of Father God on his throne. Um, and so we can picture, you know, for example, uh, a, a huge shining lighted form seated on the throne. But, but you, Spirit... A little tougher. In fact, Scripture describes you as wind. And Jesus, in talking with Nicodemus, says, you know, people don't know where the wind is coming or where it's going. They can see the effects of it, but they can't see the wind itself. And there's a pun in there because, frankly, the name for wind and the name for you, Holy Spirit, is the same word. And that is just as true. We can't see you. We can see where you're coming from and where you go and we can see the effects that you have on our lives but you're hard to picture so holy spirit we ask this morning that you would help us to trust when we can't get an image of you in our hearts and minds that's okay as long as those same hearts and minds are open to your leading to your guiding to your speaking to us and so if there's anything that's merely human in this time, Holy Spirit, we'd ask that that would be forgotten. And that which is from you would be what is here and noticed today. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Let me set the stage for you. It's a Saturday morning on a holiday weekend. Apparently, the mom of the family doesn't feel like cooking. And the dad of the family is smart and says, well, let's go out for breakfast. So they pack up all the kids in the car, they drive to their favorite spot, and it is packed. So the family goes inside and they sign their name on a call list in this crowded restaurant. And the mom is concerned because she's thinking she's going to be unable to hear their call. She didn't want to wander too far away from the door. So she has an argument with her kids. Don't you run off. We have to stay here so we can hear our name called. When the diner was ready to seat her and her family, a little tiny petite server steps out and bellows her name, which you can hear for easily a half a block away. That family heard that call and responded and came running and got seated. We are like that family. We have heard God's call and responded. In fact, in the Bible, the word for church, ecclesia, means the called out ones. It is as if the father is shouting out, hey, you, to the entire world that's facing away from him. And everyone who turns around and looks at him responds to his call is the church. I'm going to challenge us this morning to listen for two things that we are to hear as we are listening for the call. And the first one we're going to find in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 4. If you would turn with me in your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 4. 9 through 14, so let's read. Only be careful 
And watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. You came near. And you stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow and then wrote them on two stone tablets. And the Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and the laws you are to follow in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. We are the called out ones. And the first challenge that we are to hear is this call to recall. The call to recall, the idea that we need to remember. In verses 9 and 10, God spoke to Israel that they are to remember and to pass on what they remember. Part of living in God's promise is to pass on that promise to our children and our grandchildren. Here's a simple truth that's important for us to understand. Family stories are foundational. Family stories are foundational. They help us realize who we are and they help us realize how we are to react to the surrounding circumstances. Kids watch mom and dad. Grandchildren learn stories from grandma and grandpa about how they lived and move and had their being. And in doing so, they pick up those cues as well for their own example. Here is a cherished family story for you. A young wife was being teased by her new husband. And she warned him that if he didn't stop it, She would dump the entire pot of spaghetti sauce on his head. And his response was, you wouldn't dare. That's how I came to know that you shouldn't push mom too far. My dad told that story with pride that he learned the hard way how to respect his wife as his equal. That's how I also learned how multifunctional a good pot of spaghetti sauce can be. In verses 11 and 12, we read that God's people heard him speak. The Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words. Now, let me ask you, have you heard God speak? Maybe you haven't heard an audible voice. Maybe no voice has come out of the cloud for you, and perhaps the entire covenant wasn't declared to you. But have you heard God speak to you? Have you heard him say, my child, this is what I want for you. This is what I want you to do. In case you're wondering how God could be speaking, on the back of your sermon notes insert, I've listed nine ways that God speaks to us today. Now, I'm not going to go over these point by point. That would make this a much longer sermon. But regardless of the way that God chooses to reveal or speak to us today, remember this one truth. As you're reading through all of those, consider this. God will never contradict his word. God will never contradict his word. And the message he gives will always bring glory to God. The Bible warns about anything being added to the already written God-breathed word or accepting any other messenger who claims to be superior to Jesus. And absolutely, that applies to this pulpit as well. Don't just sit there and accept everything I have to say. Check my work. Go into the scripture. That's one of the reasons why I I really try to go line by line, verse by verse through the scripture. It makes it easier for us all to check. And in the instances where I have been wrong and I've said something wrong, Jamie's usually good about pointing this out to me after the sermon, I will come back and preach the retraction and say, oh, I said this last week, it was wrong, I meant this thing. So check my work. And not just my work, there are lots of people who claim to be teachers of God who vary way off and they get pretty far away from the source text. Check that. Let's get back to Deuteronomy and we'll look at verse 13. 
he declared to you his covenant. The Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow and then wrote them on two stone tablets. The people of God received God's promise. He spoke to their hearts and then he wrote it down. And that same word, which was given to the Israelites so long ago, we hold in our hands now. That hasn't changed. It's been translated, yes, into lots of different languages all over the world. But the fact is that God's promises haven't changed for us. One of my favorite things that I've ever personally had the opportunity to do was to go to a museum exhibit of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, for hundreds of years, critics of Scripture said, you can't possibly know if the Bible is true. I mean, it's like the game of telephone. It's, it's obviously changed over however many thousands of years it's been in existence. It can't possibly be the right thing. And then in, I, I might get the date wrong, but I want to say 1938, some little shepherd boy is throwing rocks. There's caves in the hillside. And of course, they're trying to say, can you hit that spot? So he throws a rock and he hears, I broke something. So they had to climb up there and figure out what it is they broke. And they found cave after cave after cave after cave that had really old jars. And inside the jars, sealed jars, were scrolls that had ancient Hebrew on them. Archaeologists took these scrolls out, examined them, and realized they had found scripture that the Essenes had written right around Jesus' time. So these things are 2,000 years old. And guess what they discovered about the Hebrew? You know what changed? The style of handwriting. But the content hadn't changed. And all of those people for hundreds of years are saying, you can't possibly know that the Bible is trustworthy. knew because you could compare the Dead Sea Scrolls from 2,000 years ago and modern Masoretic Hebrew that's, you know, being printed over in Germany or wherever. And it's the same thing. It's just that handwriting is a little tidier. But the message hasn't changed. God's word doesn't change. It's declared to us. His promises are solid. You see, God's people were to take their cue from God's given covenant. They weren't just to listen to it, but to become shaped by it. So let me ask you, are you fixed in your faith foundation? On what is your faith based? Is it just a nice feeling that you get when you come to church? Is it the idea that you're part of a shared community? Now, don't get me wrong. Those things are great, but feelings change. Communities evaporate over time. Consider this. In the quadrangle of Leland Stanford University near San Francisco, there stood a great, magnificent memorial arch built so largely and solidly and splendidly it seemed as if it would stand forever and then the 1906 earthquake hit and shook that thing down to its core and over it went it collapsed and as it collapsed the, its foundations were disclosed the builder had put in chips and rubble to expand the the area on which everything else was founded. The loose nature of that foundation led to that pillar's downfall. It's the same way with people when their own lives falter. Many seem to be successful for a time and then suddenly collapse. The secret sin comes to light. Foundation's rottenness is disclosed. Now, let me encourage you with this story. Find your foundation in the word of God, which does not change, and it will stay rock solid. And frankly, so will we. As Israel enters into the promised land, verse 14, they are to continue in the teaching that they have received. How are you living in God's promise that you've received? Consider this promise that we looked at last week. If you have the Son, you have life. And these things 
I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Again, from 1 John chapter 5, 11, 12, 13. What do you do with your eternal life on this side of heaven? While we're walking around in our tabernacles, how does that shape us? How does it affect how we live? Take a few moments. There's a space at the bottom of your insert. Write down one or two actions that you feel the Lord is prompting you to take this week. Maybe there's one or two people for whom you know you need to pray. Write that down and refer back to it this week. I'll just give you a moment. We are the called out ones. Are we hearing our call to recall, to think again about what God is doing for his people? How are we grafted into that people? And therefore, what is God planning to do through us? Are we hearing that, basing our lives on it, making sure that it's carried out and told to our children and our grandchildren? Share your foundational stories of faith with your family. The second challenge we need to hear is in the New Testament. We'll be looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6, focusing on verses 11 through 14 today. Now, last Sunday, we looked at verses 11 and 12, and today we'll pick up two more verses. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That's what we looked at last week. And now, in the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the sentence completes in the next couple of verses, but today we're going to stop right here. We, the called out ones, are challenged to hear our call to recall from Deuteronomy. We're also challenged to hear our charge to renew. To hear our charge to renew. Now, last week we looked at verses 11 and 12. So here's a little recall, a little recap. We talked about when you are fighting your own flesh, you are to flee what is false and grip what is good. Remember that? Then we get to verse 13. And Paul uses a really interesting to me phrase here in light of god the father and in light of how jesus gave his testimony in front of pontius pilate i charge you he says that word charge let's talk about that for a minute it means to transmit a received message to transmit a received message now i performed a wedding this last week and there's always a part in my wedding ceremony that's called the minister's charge it's where the minister is to try and encourage the couple getting married that they have specific obligations as a part of married life. Now, candidly, most couples are staring googly-eyed at each other, and I'm not sure they remember anything I have to say. So I try to make it as memorable as I possibly can. I explained that as a husband and wife, they are to live in a dance of arrangement in their lives. I told them this in the rehearsal that when we got to this part, I was going to talk to them about a dance. And they both got this kind of worried look on their face. Excellent. They were ready to listen. This word in Ephesians chapter 5 is upotasso. It means to arrange our lives underneath one another. It's actually a term from the military. We get our marching orders, and so we march. But you know, armies don't march willy-nilly. There's a lot of preparation that goes into that. There's a lot of infrastructure that goes along with the army. Somebody's got to make sure that everybody's got boots. Somebody's got to make sure that everybody's got lunch. Someone has to make sure that everyone who's supposed to be marching is there to march. Details. Infrastructure. It doesn't just happen to take work. So does a marriage. Or that's what the word charge means, to transmit a received message. Company forward, march, and then everyone marches. In a wedding, that charge is basically, couple, forward, love. As they move forward in time, couples getting married often receive a charge from ministers, reminders that it's more than just the emotional, I'm caught up in that feeling of love. 
There's also the choice to love when it's more difficult, when you're tired and you don't want to do it. And it's a Monday at four o'clock in the morning and the baby's been colicky all night and hasn't let you sleep. Love, that's the charge. Paul charges Timothy, and by extension, us, because we're reading this personal letter. And just as Timothy was given a charge, we are given much the same one in verse 14. Paul encourages us to do the same thing that Jesus did, to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearance of the Lord Jesus. And which command is that? It was to fight the good fight of the faith. Flee that which is false. Grip that which is good. Take hold of eternal life. Make your good confession. Pass along what you have received. Call back to Deuteronomy. On January 21st, 1930, England's King George V was scheduled to give the opening address at the London Arms Conference, and the king's message was to be sent by radio all around the world. A few minutes before the king was to speak, a member of the CBS staff tripped over an electrical wire and broke it, cutting off the entire American audience. With no hesitation, Chief Control Operator Harold Vidian grasped one end of the broken wire in his right hand and the other end in his left, restoring the circuit, and 250 volts of electricity went through him. And he ignored that pain and held on until the king finished his address. The message of the King of Kings is to go out to the whole world, but only as we allow God's power to pass through us can the Lord's saving gospel be transmitted. Paul wrote in Romans, how shall they believe him of whom they have not heard? If we are willing to serve as conduits, Regardless of the cost to us, good news will be proclaimed everywhere. I've often said that we minister out of who we are. Part of our ministry as individual followers of Jesus is to know who we are and how God has made us to be. Some of us are vocal. Some of us are not. Some are incredibly compassionate, while others are very good at keeping to the rules. Some of us care for the needy outside of the confines of the congregation, and some of us find other ways to care for those who need care. All of these examples, and so many more that I could go over, are personal expressions of passing along what was entrusted to us, that God's grace is available for everyone. What a shame that some people are so frustrated by distasteful behavior from those who wear the label Christian, that they're content to reject the Savior as well as particular behaviors they don't like. Let your heart be moved to participate in helping others however you choose to do it so that Jesus can be seen in our lives. Let's pray. Lord God, what a challenge to recognize that just the very way we live and move and have our being is our testimony. I have not yet up to this point made people stand up here in front with a mic, tell their whole testimony about how you changed their lives. Some people would probably faint on the spot before they even got up to the front because not everybody is like that. But we all shout who you are to the world in how we live. And so, Lord, I pray that we would, frankly, shout the right stuff. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Help us to show that loving and forgiving and redeeming grace to a watching world. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.